Further to my compare and contrast between um, nihilism and perspectivism, um, it's often ni uh, perspectivism is often taken as um, a strange certainty that nothing exists or nothing matters or whatever. Um, just because there's no precision to it and it kind of militates against precision, that isn't necessarily a problem. Um, if you sort of examine what a perspectivist worldview would be, uh, I guess I'd start off with um, the famous inscription in Delphi in Greece, or the second most famous one. The, the most famous one was Gnothi se oton, which means know thyself. In other words, know your limitations. Um, and the other one is, of course, miden agan, often um, translated as, <coughs> excuse me, nothing in excess, um, or all things in moderation. I see it as nothing in excess, and I think that's closer to the actual original ancient Greek. Um, now, what does that mean, really? Well, you can go to Aristotle, and when he talks about the golden mean, I guess, or the mean between two extremes, i.e. in terms of virtues, I guess, you have um, too much uh, restraint or too little restraint. Too much restraint, and you don't do anything. You sit there and rot away. Um, too little restraint, and you kind of have a personality like me, <laughs> where you're just sort of intense all the time. And non-restraint is a vice, and so, do, so is being excessively restrained, where you're a human doormat. Um, and, you know, what do you mean by restraint in any case? You can say um, somebody is excessively restrained deliberately in a passive-aggressive way. <laughs> know anybody like that? Um, <clears throat> so you don't really have a proper or at least a precise set of goalposts when you want to dis describe restraint. The virtue of restraint or the ethicity of restraint. Um, you can use that. You know, the, you've, you've got a virtue between two vices. That's the way it's normally put together. But it's approached negatively. Uh, you're looking for excesses or omissions or insufficiencies, I guess, on two sides of something that you can't precisely nail down. Um, now, that really isn't a problem, or at least it's less of a problem than one might think, simply because at any given second of your existence, you are attempting to act or to refrain from acting as required by the circumstances surrounding you. The thing is, the circumstances are fluid in every sense of the word, every sense of the concept. So you've got a never-ending uh, succession, rapid succession, insanely rapid succession <laughs> of decisions as to what to do, how to do it, and in what amount, and in what context and when to stop and this sort of thing. And it's something that's happening in real time all the time. You can't expect yourself to be absolutely ethical, but I would say that being ethical as a general habit or a general principle is doable. Just because we don't know what right is, in an absolute sense, doesn't mean that we don't agree with the entire concept, I guess, of rightness. Um, what ought we to do? Well, what ought you to do for what reason? Well, I want to be ethical, or I want to be virtuous, or whatever. Um, ergo, I want to avoid the vices. So you have to have two vices, and in the middle, between those two, you've got a virtue. Or you could say, between two polarities, you've got unethical, and in the middle, you've got ethical. That's not to say that you have to get just dead center of the two, 
because you're not really sure where dead center between too much and too little is. Just enough. How do you... Where is that point? It's not necessarily there. In fact, it might not be there at all, but in terms of actually attempting to crack the ethical puzzle, it's not essential that you actually discover precisely what courage is, precisely what uh, intemperance is, or whatever. Um, you don't have to decide precisely what any of the vices or virtues actually are. You just have to know what excess and insufficient uh, amounts of these are. <clears throat> there are too many things happening in the course of a human in, in a course of human existence for you to be right all the time. But if you actually just apply this litmus test to it, what's too much and what's too little of this, you've got something along the lines of they call it a mean as opposed to a middle. Um, I tend to see it as something that is only apparent by that which it is contrasted to. Um, <clears throat> the metaphor that I like to bring up often is um, the Jane Sida, where you're trying to you're trying to um, portray the what is colloquially referred to as the liberated soul. A bad translation, but kind of what they're trying to talk about. Uh, what does it mean when consciousness itself has blissfully detached itself from phenomenality? Um, and of course what you have is you just have a, it's usually a sheet of metal with uh, an image punched out. So the metal isn't the image, it's the shape that's punched into the uh, uh, metal that you're looking at, even though the image itself is actually an absence. That's a, a sida. Uh, they, they call it Jain uh, sidas, but it's it's used in other um, dharmic uh, points of view. Hinduism, and you know, I think even Buddhism has some mention of it. Now, it's not the same thing as the Hindu idea of neti neti, which means not this, not this. It's similar, but it's not quite the same thing. Because you've got two versions of notness. You've got too much and too little. And that which is neither, you've got what is enough, or the correct amount, or even though that's a puny way of describing it. Um, <clears throat> it's just a caution to say that we know what courage is, but it's perishing hard to pin it down specifically. And it's impossible to have sufficient information at any given moment in time for you to make correct value judgments um, all the time. But you can be, generally, you can alter your position on the continuity between being, I guess, a vicious or vice-ridden person and being a, a virtuous person. Now, you, this is all referring, I guess, to virtue ethics, but it's not necessarily um, exclusive to virtue ethics. You can go at many things, many points of, uh, many ethical points of view, and say, okay, we know what too much is, and we know what too little is, what's in the middle. Um, you can get deontological on that if you want. Um, you can, you know, you can go to many different kinds of uh, ethical points of view. I doubt that anyone would say that there's no such thing as an excess of anything, because um, anything by its very nature can go to an excess and become a vice, or become a, not even a vice, a harm, whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> no, this doesn't give you any precision as to what it means to believe in something. It's not a fixed point. Um, this golden mean, actually, I can you can apply even to ontology. You can apply it to uh, epistemology, if you ask me. Um, you can apply it to many things. You just sort of look at it from two extreme positions, which is not that difficult to do. Um, and then you you can see how somewhere in between those lies what you're looking for. You're not absolutely certain 
that there are any boundaries where you can now say I'm off wrong and I'm now right. Again, one has to sort of disabuse oneself of those three uh, classic rules of logic. It's not that you have to throw them out, is you have to put them in their proper place. They are tools to help you do things. They, ha they are not the logical equi equivalent of Moses' tablets. It, the, that's not how I see the three classic rules of logic, or laws of logic, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I would call the golden mean a tool, uh, uh, almost a law, if you want to put it that way. Um, an idea that even if we can't be precise, we can still infer, or not even infer, but we can look at things elliptically. We can look at things sort of um, obliquely. You can't stare right at them and see what they are, but you can have some idea as to what they are not, or perhaps what they are closer to. This is not nihilism. This is not a denial of anything. It's more or less, if you ask me, a means of navigating the apparent unity that coexists with the apparent diversity of reality. Um, Mystic of the Sands did a sort of I don't know, compare and contrast or whatever between the Vishvarupa, i.e. the universal form where um, Krishna in the Gita shows Arjuna uh, basically everything at once saying this is me and this is reality and you know he just sees everything everything that ever existed ever will exist ever will be conceived of every you know from every possible angle all at once and you say okay there's the vishvarupa and then there's the void which is apparently what the buddhist taught and you know people often like to compare and contrast the gita's version of reality with the buddhistic or even in my opinion better version uh, the um, Jain version um, to say that the, that reality is essentially nothingness, whereas the Gita says reality is everythingness, and Mystic of the Sands sort of playfully sort of put the two together as if to say, what's the difference? Uh, I, I assume that's what he was doing in the comment he left on my previous video. So just because we don't have a precise break point between one thing and another, or one concept and another, doesn't mean that these concepts are without meaning. Um, it just means that they're damned hard to pin down precisely. Um, and not only that, they're so difficult to, to pin down precisely that you're actually wasting... Uh, wasting time, I suppose, is not the correct way to, to say this, but you're trying to do something that may not be done, may not be possible, i.e., get everything right all the time. Um, because you sort of, when you agonize over one choice or one definition or one attempt to perceive something correctly, you're immediately faced with another perception, another experience, and you have to scramble to sort of figure that one out. And then another one comes at you, and a million of them come at once. The more perceptions and experiences you have, the more you realize you're, you're, you're ignoring a lot of them and throwing them by the wayside, because you can't cope with these right now, because everything is coming at you so rapidly. Again, Pyro's information stream, right? It, or, or my, it's not really my metaphor, but my view of looking, in a moving car, looking backwards at reality receding away from you or turning your head around looking over the driver's shoulder into the oncoming onslaught of experiences um, most people look backwards the aim of the discipline I guess I follow is to look turn your head around and look forward you want to see what's coming you want to see what what makes things be, not just make, makes things be what they are, and you want to know what existence actually means in terms of a constantly changing reality. So you can't always make um, 
correct decisions and ethical decisions on any on, on everything. And then not only that, you can really get horribly sidetracked in attempting to do so because you ignore all the other perceptions that you're having, all the other experiences. It's more or less where are you in that information stream? Where are you in terms of overall um, what you call it? Accuracy of perception, overall ethicity, um, overall um, ab uh, your overall ability to apprehend what's happening, your overall ability to grasp what's going on, what you are, etc. Where are you? How, are you deeply in error, or are you um, not in as big of an error as you may be? Uh, assuming errorness is possible in a completely changing, fluid, and non-categorized reality. It's not, again, perspectivism might say that um, everyone's perceptions or perspective is unto itself valid. It doesn't mean that in other words, if I'm having an experience, I'm having an experience. If I'm having an experience of speaking Turkish to the flying spaghetti monster, then I'm having that experience. However, um, again, you can sort of go with the golden mean there and say, well, I've never seen anyone doing this. Uh, I suppose it's possible, because just because I have never seen something doesn't mean it's not happening. But not only have I never seen something like this, but it it's so completely different from anything I have ever seen that it may be more likely to fall under the rubric of extremely unlikely as opposed to extremely likely. I still don't know for sure, but on a general continuum, I'm going towards the unlikely. Now, the reason why I do that why well, you sort of put two goalposts there. It's again, Gnothi se Oton, know your boundaries, right? Too much, too little, or probably uh, very far from what reality is. Probably a little bit closer. Again, um, what's more believable for me right now, that I'm speaking into a web camera, or that I'm directing the French, the Imperial French Army at the battlefield of Waterloo? Well, I'm probably not Napoleon, because I've never had any evidence that I am. And I have some evidence right now that I'm speaking into a web camera. I don't know for certain that I'm not Napoleon daydreaming before he orders the final attack of his army against the British and Prussians. I'm not certain of that. It's possible. But everything that I'm experiencing right now militates towards that not being the case, and it being the case of me just yattering into my webcam. Again, it's not I'm not categorically saying that I am or I'm not doing these things, but if you sort of apply the Midanagan thing along with the Gnothi Se Oton, because again, the Gnothi Se Oton, nothing in excess, or sorry, know thyself means you're human, you have limits. Midanagan sort of says, you can't really see where your limits are, but you can somehow define what limitation may mean when it comes to your tools to perceive. <laughs> so again, it's not nihilism as it is an acknowledgement of imprecision. So instead of trying to nail something down, we're trying to narrow things down. Fully aware of the fact that the margin for error is enormous. But, again, since it's something that one works at, as opposed to something that you just, bing, know by some logical formula or whatever, um, that's not as big of a problem as you might think. And, again, you sort of, this goes back to the, to the um, um, dogmatic uh, type of view. The dogmatic person thinks, I've discovered truth. I've discovered reality. I no longer need to have my 
golden mean anymore because I'm already there. I can dispense with this tool. That's the danger of dogmatism, if you ask me. Nihilism, I guess, would say we don't even know what too much or too little is. Which is possible, but it does strike me that too much and too little are useful tools in which to narrow the goalposts or narrow the, limita the, the, the boundaries that we exist in, or at least narrow our perception of the boundaries. Um, <clears throat> what is it that we're seeking to do here? Are we seeking to be right? Are we seeking to um, discover a truth? Again, uh, one would assume that a skeptic would sort of say, okay, I'm skeptical and I'm still looking, but eventually I'll find a truth. Or are we trying to perceive? Um, Nietzsche said it best, if you want peace of mind, then believe. If you want, if you would seek after truth, then inquire. Doesn't say, he doesn't tell you that you'll find it. <laughs> he just tells you that you might actually get closer to being in touch with truth. <laughs> Um, as we know what we know that there are erroneous things to do um, if I want to improve my health I don't lay on the couch eating pork rinds and drinking beer all day um, that's not to say that it's guaranteed to destroy your health my grandfather lived a horribly unhealthy life and he lived to be 84 <laughs> so and he was quite healthy um, but by the same token, um, being a very healthy, active person doesn't guarantee you're not going to get cancer. <laughs> um, we, there is no absolute recipe for health or for anything else. But there is a continuum, and we can at least see our relative position on that continuum. Um, or at least infer, or perhaps intuit, our relative position. What is the compass that we use to gauge our position? Well, I would say that a good start is too much and too little of everything. <laughs>